Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE. We're live here in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. And uh, this is theCUBE, we extract the signal from the noise, go out to the events and talk to all the folks we can talk to out there, entrepreneurs, engineers, CEOs of big companies. And we are here, Big Data, SV, our event, in conjunction with Strata Conference and Hadoop World. Our next guest is from Google, Eric Schmidt, the product manager, not the former CEO of Google. I uh, love the name, can you a big smile over there. It's just so, I was, so Eric Schmidt on the schedule, I just couldn't laugh. Welcome to theCUBE, Eric Schmidt, product manager, Google's cloud data flow uh, product, obviously in context to, to Big Data Week here. Uh, yes. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thanks. Um, so obviously Google is, you know, we're big fans of what you guys are doing in the cloud. Love the scale of Google, love the developer traction. Kubernetes is awesome, hot product. Um, obviously in the stack is data, right? You got to do something with data. A lot of hot stuff going on in memory, streaming, all this stuff's hot. Application developers want the data. A lot of stuff being architected. Tell us what's going on with you guys with Dataflow and how does this all connect in with Google Cloud and, and what you're doing here? Sure, so I guess uh, a little bit of history. We announced um, in, at Google I.O., the past Google I.O., that uh, we were building a fully managed service for parallelized data processing, which we, was called Dataflow. And Dataflow is a, a synthesis of, of really two main efforts inside of Google. You know, back in 2004, we released um, our thoughts on this concept called MapReduce, and then internally continued to build um, an implementation. And you know, yeah, if fortunately, you had only um, open source MapReduce, Cloudera wouldn't be, exist. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother story. We'll go down there in a second. I, I was really excited to. To see just how much um, momentum and excitement uh, from the community and innovation that's happening, and it's so awesome. you know, it's we been great. we obviously helped create some of that DNA, but the community at large, right? Yeah. The open source uh, process has really um, proven itself valuable uh, in producing the, the broader Hadoop ecosystem. Yeah, and, and just for folks watching out there who don't know the history, Google's DNA is all over the Hadoop uh, world as well as Yahoo, obviously where Amr worked and everyone else. But cloud, even before Cloudera became a household name, there was a ton of work done in the open source community within Apache. So that's you know, something that needs to be footnoted, I think. Yeah, and, that, and we spent some time in the session uh, earlier uh, this week, uh, basically trying to you know, map, you know, and our work in MapReduce uh, focused on batch, and then we later released a paper uh, on Millwill, which is a, a real-time stream processing system. Um, and uh, Dataflow as a, a product is really a synthesis of these two models: is bracing, bridging the, the batch world with the stream, uh, the, with the stream processing world, both uh, as a fully managed service as well as a, uh, a unified SDK. So a, a data processing, data engineer can sit down and not necessarily have to think about, you know, is my data at rest, is my data in flight, how am I going to deal with uh, uh, temporal aspects of my data, basically bringing to market a unified development model and a unified and fully managed service. So talk about the, the, that unification, because that's really key. I mean, data in flight, data at rest, these are all concepts that are obviously known, but, but relative to open source, one of the things that had do growing up fast is automation orchestration. It used to be, I mean, it still kind of is kind of a hassle, but you know, just a few years ago, a lot of work would have to be done just to kind of manage, stand up Hadoop, um, and then you add in complexity of data flowing around north, south, yeah. east, west, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's been critical, that, that automation, and to scale. So what are you guys doing to, to help that? Is that part of the piece, or? It is, so the, the, the service uh, aspects um, enable developers to, uh, in essence, specify the, the type of uh, boundaries that they would um, that would they would like in their cluster to to manage their data. So you could kind of think of a, a typical uh, on-premise Hadoop implementation where you kind of do a lot of architecture design, figure out what type of node structure you want. You go buy, acquire, and then rack up. Um, that cluster, uh, which is great, but it's not necessarily the best uh, solution if you have a lot of volatile usage or you know, your business counterparts are constantly calling up the next day and saying, hey, we need more capacity, we need you to be able to expand. 
So the service aspects, uh, the elastic aspects of the service enable a developer to specify a set of boundaries. Hey, this is the minimum size and potentially maximum size of the cluster. You d deploy that cluster into, or ask Dataflow to deploy that cluster on your behalf. Um, and we will modulate, you know, expand and shrink down the size of that cluster to, to keep up yeah. with your data rates. Now, in-, in versus, the versus dealing with all the hassles of managing elastic things like control plane and like all the other plumbing. I exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> How do I say it? And, Hassles. And, and you know what I'm saying, developers just, that's DevOps, that's a DevOps kind of concept. It, right? it, it is, but you know, if you, it, whenever you get into talking to like hardcore and some traditional MapReduce developers, they're doing that development, but they're also having to put on that DevOps hat, right? And, you know, their yeah. their operations uh, person, persons maybe that's responsible for their NAS or their storage system, those guys are usually pretty close buddies because they're yeah. having to figure out different sharding techniques for uh, uh, different data sizes, yeah. you know, volatile changes in key structure and data. Um, and our goal is to really help kind of offset a lot of that work, um, you know, in, in some cases completely remove it. Um, and the, the, the concept of auto scanning those clusters um, is both a benefit in the batch sense, so you can, in essence, improve clock time. You know, your boss calls up tomorrow and says, hey, I need this answer, but I need it in three hours faster. We give you the ability to expand your clusters easily so that you can get um, questions faster. In streaming mode, it's really about uh, dealing with um, ingest rates of data. You know, if you can't process fast enough, then you're going to have lag. Yeah. Lag then introduces either inaccuracy in data or unavailability of data. So what is so. data flow targeted to? I mean, is it targeted to the developers? Is it targeted to the DevOps guy? Obviously your alpha, is that alpha in terms of deploying or coding, development kit? Is it for just data jockeys and wranglers? I mean, I mean what is the, the focus or all of the above? Yeah, it's, the, the sweet spot right now is, is focused really on your, your data processing engineer. The, the, the guy or girl whose task it is to do traditional ETL know, getting data moved from disparate um, sources um, and the temporary storage locations. A lot of pipelining kind of thing. Exactly. You know, getting them, getting that data into their data warehouse. Maybe they're using BigQuery as an example to do a lot of interactive analysis and they have terabytes or petabytes worth of data on GCS. How do you, how do you get that data moved? Then you get into more advanced movement like doing filtering, enrichment, shaping of data. So that's kind of one, you know, one stack. The second stack is, um, doing analysis, either batch, you know, spot analysis, or doing continuous computation over that data. Um, so use cases would be, maybe you are doing basically classic ETL you know, into your system, but at the same time, you have some in-flight data that you would like to continuously monitor. Maybe you want to push it out to uh, a monitoring agent so your broader network operations people can kind of see, this is what's happening with my, my kind of inbound control plane with, with data, and then this is what's happening in real time with kind of user-based data, so you can start correlating those, those two aspects. Um, and the, the third use case would be someone um, typically maybe higher uh, ab above those data processing engineers who is trying to synthesize or orchestrate um, data processing logic across multiple flows. Like you have maybe yeah. you know one, one process that's all about ingestion of data type A, another process for data type B, data type C, et cetera, being able to synthesize or fuse those flows together that represent something meaningful for the business. So it's really it's kind of three different personas. Yeah. Uh, so talk about the open source piece. You guys have some open source component and also talk about the alpha, is application driven? Are you just submitting applications, you approve all of them? Is there a criteria? I mean, yeah. It seems like there's like a black box there. You know, yeah. Tell us what the, what's behind the, the curtain. So on the open source side, we open uh, source our Java 7 implementation. Uh, we pushed that out to uh, GitHub right before uh, Christmas, uh, December 17th, I think was the day. Um, that build, the, the build that's in GitHub is our build. It's the same build that we are shipping and promoting with, with the product. We also have a Python 2 implementation in the works that whenever we um, have it uh, feature complete and stabilized, we will also open source that as well. Um, subsequently though, since then, um, several uh, companies have uh, produced Scala ports, um, which is a relatively straightforward um, uh, thing to do because they can wrap on top of our Java 7 implementation. Uh, we are also seeing some traction though on alternate runners and the idea would be you would develop in Dataflow 
you'd write your code in Dataflow, but instead of executing it on our managed service, you could say execute it uh, on your own self-managed Spark cluster. So Josh Wills over at Cloudera, who was the inventor of Crunch, he jumped into the mix and said, hey, I'd, I like Dataflow as a programming model, but I'd really like to have it run on Spark. So he's contributed that back. Um, the folks over at Data Artisans, they're also building a Flink runner that I think will be out in the next week or two. So that's kind of where we're at um, in the short, whatever, two and a half months from an open source perspective. We'd like to see a lot more um, extensions, you know, inputs, output support, different types of transforms that people are sharing. Uh, I think your other question was about kind of the, yeah, yeah, like the how, do you, how do you get in? Um, if you go to cloud.google.com slash dataflow um, and say sign up. And it the, says apply for ap alpha. Apply for alpha. Type in a little bit of information and myself and some other folks process that on a daily, every other day basis. So is there like an algorithm you guys have uh, in terms of our filter? You're looking for keywords. Just, I mean, it's obviously, I mean, it's probably vetting, simple vetting process or is it a complex vetting process? Um, in or is the, it random? In, in, like, in the beginning. When you get to yeah. it. <laughs> in the beginning, and I think this is. Or is it, it's controlled alpha, right? I mean, essentially it's directed availability on the alpha. In the beginning, whenever we, we released in, in last uh, summer uh, for EAP, um, and I think this is common for most projects like this, y you are selective, yeah. right? B mainly because you're trying to control the, the pressure back on your engineering and the rest yeah, of the Yeah, and resources. the team managing yeah. it. You don't want to open the kimono yeah. too fast. So, um, but we're in the process now. We're, we're pretty much onboarding everyone that comes through. Uh, yeah, we did so that with our CrowdChat app for a good year. Yeah. Just limited alpha who can do it just to see yeah. patterns that we, want, we didn't want to get you know, killed by you know, a thousand paper cuts of like support. <laughs> exactly, yeah, and then you also, yeah. you start clustering around issues and then you can solve yeah. them. So I, I feel, you know, on the product management side, we, we feel pretty good where we're at right now yeah. in terms of supportability. You know, we, we've hammered out most of the usability issues. Um, so yeah, we're, we're actively onboarding and what's the beta timetable? Are you looking out uh, at Google I.O. or next event, or what's the timetable? Any roadmap there in terms of, <laughs> I'm not going to hold you to numbers. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> have, I don't <laughs> have. Not like the, not, you're going to get, you know, get assassinated <laughs> for not making the number. I mean, come on, this is just like, is it like this year, I second half of the year, don't know? So I don't have a, 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 a time dimension in the future that I can, or a time, uh, a specific, um, time answer that I can give you. Um, the, the joke that I made yesterday. You're working on it. This no, the joke that I made answer. yesterday is like, if you look at the timeline as we were building MapReduce, Flume, Dremel, Millwell, et cetera, and then we, we basically have been taking lots of that technology to cloud. We released Dataflow in June of 2014 in EAP mode, and then we went to alpha December 17th. So if you if you kind of want to do some like estimation on yeah, like historical trajectory, <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, thanks for the I'll, I'll work on that tonight. So uh, I'll be up no. all night working on Google's. You know, I'll break this big story. Oh, we are we are working. Yeah, as fast. Google, the, uh, the compute yeah. engine did the same thing. You guys, it's a standard operating procedure. Google. Yeah, we're we're working as fast as yeah. possible to get the market. All right. So what's the so coolest thing that you're you you think is going on there I mean, in terms of you know where you see you get excited. Uh, is it the Spark piece? Is it the pipelining? Is it is it the unification of the programming? Is it open source? What's the and what are people? Yeah. What are the people? What are the people saying about? It? What's the conversation around this? There, there are several. There, there are several of the cool things or things that that, that really excite me. Um, uh, one of which is our our um, sophistication or intelligence around our windowing support. Um, you know, other programming models have the concept of Windows basically being able to bucket um, data into Windows. We have fixed Windows, we have sliding with Windows. We've also implemented the concept of session-based Windows. So if you don't necessarily know a specific key, we, you can ask the system to look at streams of data and attempt to infer this is a start point and, a, and an end point for a particular system, which is great for like log processing. You may not yeah. know who the user ID is, but you can look at a pattern. Um, so there's some sophistication there, but we, we've also implemented this concept of uh, triggers and watermarks, which enable a developer to specify custom timestamps for input data. This is something that uh, Spark developers are challenged with a lot today in streaming mode, where Spark is looking at input data and timestamping it as it arrives into the system, which is great for a lot of systems, but if you want to do correlation back to the actual event time, say on a, you know, on a mobile device or yeah. something like that, you potentially have some, some time drift there. So I'm super excited that we have this ability to basically 
you know, deal with arrival time and or source time and then give the developer the, the ability to basically control how they want to deal with, with late arriving data. Um, and it begins with a windowing support and we have this concept of triggers and watermarks. You wrap them all together and at the end of the day, we provide a high level of tuning to dial in correctness of data. Um, you know, real-time streaming is hard because yeah, is, you're, yeah. you never know whenever you have all of your data. And sometimes you may never get all of it. So then the question is, well, yeah. when do you emit your windows? How do you deal with late arriving data? So that's something that I'm really, really excited yeah, it about. It reminds me of the old days of TCP IP and packet, you know, packets for networks. I mean, it's a network yep. packet kind of problem. You got to know the flows. There's also some contextual data and instrumentation you need. So it's yep. really complex. Yep. Well, Eric, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. We've got to wrap up that segment, getting the hook here from the folks on the timetable. Um, final word, um, what's, what do you think about the show here I mean, this week? I mean, what, what's uh, the vibe? What have you learned? What's the big aha in terms of the, nav the vector we're on, the navigation, the path? to the future, what's happening I, here. I, I see a massive shift from people moving uh, as fast as way as possible from batch to get to real time. Uh, and, and, uh, and then the extension of ML uh, applied, you know, to applied to real time. And I, I'm extremely excited about that. Like I've, I've played in the batch processing space for a long time, but always wanted to be in real time. You know. So okay, that my, I have to ask this because you know the whole people who watch know that I hate the term data lake because I think it's, it, it symbolizes slowness and like batch, so that's yeah. a batch concept. The ocean, like the Pacific, is like always moving, it's always changing, yep. and there's different currents, different ecosystems. That's really the big data world in the future. Are you going to have that kind of current? So I'm kind of hardcore. It might not stick, not that I care, but, but in terms of data, it's complex. In real time, you're dealing with that kind of you know, unknown at any given time, a rip current of new things could be streaming, right? So what's your take on that? Do you see it that way? I mean, not to say data, you don't have to agree with me, but like that kind of real time, complexity can arise just as fast as the benefits. Exactly, and we're seeing that from our customer base, um, whether it's you know, s small orgs, startups, or very large orgs, they're dealing with these types of problems. Like you know, one day they, they feel like they have some type of um, consistency around their data processing, and boom, the next day, you know, another part of their organization launches a new game that just has you know, you know, exponentially increased the, the, their data rates, um, or they want to process net new data coming from their marketing organization, et cetera. This isn't going to stop. Like, in, yeah. in, in order to get the real intelligence out of their ML processes, they're going to need to continue to aggregate. So and in an ocean it. which feeds hurricanes, there's tsunamis, there's currents, a lot of unknown circumstances have to develop. So in your data flow vision, what do we need to build from an infrastructure and intelligence and software standpoint to make that like predictable so that at any given time, circumstances can change, hence the data has to be re adaptive and reactive in real time. Yes. So what, 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 I mean, is there any vision on that, what <laughs> needs to be in place? Well, I think what you're talking about is actually the core of the, our fully managed service. Uh, the, the faster that you can get away from having to scale to, to, to deal with the operational aspects, the more time that you can spend on actually just dealing with the data. You know, you're still going to have to shape it. You're still going to have to process it. You're going to still have to run it through um, different algorithms to, to pull out the types of data that you want and then potentially, cha cha uh, sorry, potentially train some other uh, ML implementation. That's where I think the, the, the real magic is, yeah. is going to happen. And that's a lot, of, a lot of new code ideas in there, AI, all this new stuff here people talking about, really good automation. So that's a, I mean, but it's, it's a boom for computer science. I mean, it's just going to be magical, you yeah. know. Yeah, I think using your analogy, if you can't put your arms around the ocean, and even if you could, could you hold on to it, you know, for long enough? And as more, you know, water comes into it, I don't know if, if, that, if that's capable. But this is what's happening, with, you know, with these yeah. entities, whether they're big or small. Yeah. You know, if you can do that, then then you have control over it, and you can start doing something with it. Yeah, and you can know what not to do. You don't go out and you know, <laughs> if it's a tsunami coming or a big storm coming, you don't play in that wars, or or you adjust appropriately based on what those conditions are, positive and negative. So I think, sure. you know, to me, I look at currents and rip, you know, streaming and you know, the river, these kinds of concepts have been network concepts, and it's not, it's always moving. A lake, you know, lake moves, I mean, lake is a batch. So again, I'm, I'm ranting on my data ocean. Eric Schmidt here, validating my data ocean vision. Thank you, you're the first person to support my data ocean, at least in principle. I'll put yeah. it on my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cube, we'll be right back on our next guest after the short break. Eric Schmidt from Google, Dataflow. Again, Google, great, great product, great company in terms of scale, really leading the way, again, the DNA. Uh, is you know, all over Hadoop and it's well known. So congratulations and, and always good stuff coming out of Google, always fun. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>